Howdy y'all, Joe Hills here, recording as I always do in Nashville, Tennessee, and today we are atop Joseph's amazing Technicolor dreamboat. Why? Because what lies beneath is too terrifying! Oh no, I'm terrified already! Oh wait, it's just the ocean. Boo! We really need to fix the bottom of this boat. But you know what? Sometimes, when I'm hanging out in Minecraft, just doing some stuff, like casual, filling in like hundreds of blocks, I like to get on the phone with my friends and talk about what they've been up to. And I thought, you know, one of my friends has been up to something pretty cool lately. My dungeon master from the Pathfinder game I play in every week, Quinn Murphy, actually just got published most recently. Well, he gets published all the time. But most recently, he just got published in the Pathfinder 2nd Edition Bestiary 3. So I thought, why don't I talk to him a little bit about what he's up to in game design, and, uh, you know what, maybe we can all learn something. So, I'm gonna go ahead and start grabbing some things out of this box here. I got plenty of terracotta. You know, this, this should be a piece of cake to get this built. But, you know what, maybe we'll have a, a fun chat along the way. Let me get Quinn on the line. Howdy, Quinn, can you hear me? I can. Wonderful, I love how that's replaced hello. Um... <laughs> It is wonderful to hear your voice on this fine Wednesday evening. Usually we play every Tuesday night, so this is like an extra treat for me. Yeah, it's like extra talk. This is great. Yeah, I, I'm so glad that you agreed to come on the show. Um, you know, obviously your most recent publication is, is Bestiary 3, so I was thinking maybe we'd talk about that a little bit first and then ease into kind of more general, like, uh, getting started in gaming uh, or game design and that sort of thing. Is that fair? Sure. Yeah, sounds great. Cool. Um, now, I see that in the uh, PDF of Bestiary 3, which I actually have pulled up here, you are listed as an author. So that's that's pretty cool. Could you um, share, like, what you did in terms of, like, what you actually wrote for the game? Um, sure. Um, I wrote the Sombreva and the Shabti uh, entry and the Shabti Redeemer. Mm-hmm. So the Sombreva, ooh, this actually has like a really cool illustration here. Yeah, oh god, the art order. Uh, I got a chance to peek at the art order. Um, like, you know, I'd written out kind of the description and everything on there. And it was like, you, you're like, okay. Like, there's this kind of weird thing when you do an art order where you're like, you know, like I've had art orders like completely ignored. Mm -hmm. um, and and they're just like, yeah, we're just not, we, we know you asked you to do an art order, but we're just going to do something else instead. Um, you know, um, I knew Paizo wasn't going to do that, but you just don't know how well you're communicating or who's going to receive what you're communicating. Mm -hmm. And honestly, I just felt like from what I given in the art order, it, it incorporated everything I had, I, I wanted out of it and then took it to like another level. So I was just like, so incredibly excited on that. Like, I just feel like that is like one of the coolest looking monsters in the book. Yeah. So I, I was going to say, could you describe what a Sombreva is? But I realized since I have the PDF in front of me, I could actually do give a, a little bit of a dramatic reading here. Um, sure. Some brevas are the negative energy planes, unstoppable hunters, tracking down and destroying other creatures on their plane for sport and practice. Um, so did they start by coming to you? And, and, and by they, I mean Paizo, which for anybody who doesn't know is the mm -hmm. folks who make uh, Pathfinder. Did, did they mm -hmm. come to you and say, hey we want something from the negative energy plane or we want an unstoppable hunter. Uh, what, what did they mm -hmm. come to you with in the, in the brief? Yeah. I, I mean, they, they had um, like different things, like some things were okay. We're going to just, you know, uh, sort of fill these sort of niches or sort of back, you know, port something from first edition to second edition. Mm -hmm. And then we had some, some monsters that are just, brand new things and um you know um and this one was sort of like hey we want this sort of uh negative plane apex predator mm -hmm. um uh kind of concept um and uh it was it was, it was an interesting thing like when I, I i got the assignment um i got it and it was like in, in like an hour i had like the core concept mm -hmm. of that so so that sounds like a kind of a in some ways a straightforward design challenge because the apex predator of any given ecosystem is going to be to some degree shaped by that ecosystem. I'm, I'm guessing. Right. So mm -hmm. 
were you already pretty familiar with the negative energy plane? Because honestly, this is the first time I'm hearing about it, and uh, as our party hasn't been there yet. You know, mm -hmm. uh, I play a wizard for anybody who doesn't know. So my wizard character might know this in game, but I have no idea what this is. Is this a bad place? It sounds like a bad place. I mean, yeah, it, it means, I mean, it's, I mean, it, it's, it's definitely hostile to sort of life um, as we understand it. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, you know, sort of uh, just drains sort of like if you're a living being in there, the negative energy sort of just drains things mm -hmm. um, out of you. And it's just, it's, it's kind of like, um, it's in a weird way. And, and one of the things that they did really well in Bestiary 3, I think, is that, that there are a few um, negative creatures from the negative plane. And rather than just make it like the temptation with the negative energy plane is just like make it like, you know, the night this or the sort of negative plane that and kind of pose it as a just like uh you know this like totally like evil place and and the sombrava are not um you know horribly nice and they definitely aren't evil right but they mm -hmm. have like they have an ethos right um mm -hmm. and and uh so in the negative energy plane sort of ha how how they have it here is kind of like a uh the other side right it's so like almost kind of like a without directly aping it kind of like a mirror version of sort of the of, of the sort of prime material and the sort of positive gotcha so, so there's a lot more goatees and and like torture <laughs> yes exactly gotcha okay so, so um you know as i look through here um it says creature 16 which i mean i'm assuming means it's like a challenge that's like a challenge rating equivalent is the 16 basically yeah, yeah. And uh, so it's got a, a whip drain, um, mm -hmm. which uh, causes the drain effect if you fail a DC 38 fortitude save. Mm -hmm. What what does drained do in uh, Pathfinder? So in Pathfinder, it's a sort of like uh, the sort of... Um... Where like in D D have like negative levels and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, it basically kind of like drain. It, it sort of drains you of your energy. Um, the, the the mechanical effect of it is that um, you take a penalty on um, all con uh, constitution based checks, like a fortitude check, mm -hmm. um, uh, equal to the drained level that you have, mm -hmm. and um, also you lose um, hit points equal to three times the drained level. And then it lowers your maximum hit points by a similar amount. Sounds rough. It, it can it can be very it can be very rough. I'm, I'm guessing though that to some degree anything that's like an apex predator in this plane that naturally drains things of energy has to drain things of energy first. Like it can't wait around because otherwise the the universe will do it for them mm. type of thing. Well, I mean, well, well, also for the Sembreva here. What they're really so they hunt stuff on their normal uh, on the negative energy plane, but they're real. The real way that you get ahead that they're organized in these sort of hunter lodges. They're called night lodges, mm -hmm. and um, you know you have this whole. It's, it's almost like rank like a like a shonen manga thing, right? You have your like you know F tier, and then you have your S tier at the top. Uh -huh. Night lodges. Do, do they actually um, use people, the same letters? I mean, I I don't think so, okay. but I, I like to envision it that way, right? Sure. sure. Um, and you have this sort of like these rankings of, of lodges, and up at the top are these like kind of like you know at the up at the top thing are these people who've like done all of these crazy great things, and um, you you know you get um, trophies, and and to get the best trophies, um, you sort of go on incursions into. Uh, like the into our plane, the plane. Mm -hmm. um, and then you use that draining. So they have that whip um, and they drain you mm -hmm. um, so that they can then um, claim your soul, right? Like they sort of drain you of energy. Um, they try and kill you. And then like, if they can get you, your soul kind of like, bubbles up into this blue mode of light mm -hmm. right and the worthier and the better of an opponent you are the like kind of brighter and you know more lustrous uh that blue ball is uh-huh and then they get to take it 
and claim it and then put it basically up on their wall. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so, so like, you know, on the one hand, it's like, I, I, you know, I have a great soul, obviously. So I see why people would want it. But on the other hand, I'm using that and I would prefer not to be flayed with a whip for it. So yeah, <laughs> that, that does seem pretty terrifying. Like, um, if you were, if you were talking to dungeon masters, uh, who, who were like, Oh, Hey, I saw this, this new monster that you made the Sombriva. Mm -hmm. Like where, where do I fit that in a campaign? I'm guessing this is not the sort of monster that you just are. It's like, okay, you guys are like exploring a cave and this is down the hall or, you know, down the, uh, corridor. What do caves have cavern? You know, like this is, yeah. this is the sort of thing that you might structure, uh, you know, a whole mm -hmm. session or arc around to some degree, because it mm -hmm. seems like kind of a big deal if one of these things is in town. Right, exactly. Like, so Sombreva, what, 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 what makes Sombreva sort of one of my favorite monsters I've ever designed is that they are, are wonderfully proactive, mm -hmm. right? They're not just sitting there in an ecology waiting to be discovered. Mm -hmm. They are literally like 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 to a sombreva, like because they're creature sixteen, right? So so you're not going to encounter one of these things until you're like later in your adventuring career, mm -hmm. right? You're 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 strong. You've done all these things. You've accomplished all these things. You've you know fought evil. You've turned it back. You've you know led the tide, and all of those things, all of those great accomplishments to a sombreva, just makes you a better trophy, mm -hmm. right? Like they they have this they have this perspective on adventurers that few monsters have, right? Other monsters see you as an adversary, as an obstacle, as, as lunch, mm -hmm. right? And the Braver are just kind of like, cool, like, I wanted to put that event, I've been hearing these tales of you, and I want to put you up on my wall, right? Mm -hmm. You know, or you might, you might encounter them, you know, so, 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 like, they might just attack, like, for, for what seems no reason at all to the party, they might just attack them, and then, like, in the middle of a fight, you, you know, might be communicating with one of them, and they're like, oh, no, you're going to be, like, a great trophy. And you're like, oh, what? And, like, don't let them capture one of your teammates and take them. Like, there's actually rules in the monster for the claim trophy mm -hmm. that you can go get the soul back, right? Like, they'll, they'll put it to the lodge, and that might be a thing of, okay, now you have to go over to the negative energy plane to a night lodge. Mm-hmm. And and perform like a raid to get the soul of your friend back, um, or somebody might hire you to get the soul back of somebody who was captured in a raid. There, this creates a lot of really interesting possibilities. One of the first ones that jumps out at me is when I think about like what are some funny ways to mess with players who are being obnoxious. You know, imagining the one player that thinks like, oh, I, I'm the best, I do all the damage, mm -hmm. having a Sombreva come hunt the second strongest person in the party instead of that guy <laughs> could really, uh, you know, cause some lighthearted ribbing at the table. Um, oh, yeah. And, and then you also have a thing, too, of like, they're not omniscient right like they don't they can't they don't have like worthy sense right they're looking for worthy souls but mm -hmm. a lot of it is sort of has to be sort of them sizing you up or them hearing stories and stuff and so like you know you could envision a scene where you're like going hey you think i'm a worthy soul but really i'm not the person you want to mess with like like I, you don't want me i'm terrible mm -hmm. you know who you really want that or like you like <laughs> You know, try and shift them over. A truly worthy soul would never throw his friends under the bus, and I'm about to do that right now. <laughs> so, really, do you want this soul? No, you want that soul, shining and lustrous. Nice, yeah, and, that... and, and truly unprepared for what I'm about to do to them. Yeah, and I, and I think this is really the the mark of a great monster is, is that it it elevates the game by creating opportunities for players and dungeon masters to tell a different type of story than they would have otherwise. And and there's just so many options for this other than just like do I stab it or use magic? So, yeah, th this seems really fun. Um so the uh second monster that that you mentioned was the Shab T um I see the artwork on that is pretty cool too. It's uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I really like this one. Yeah, uh, cobbled together from broken bits of mortal souls, Shabti are facsimiles of wealthy or powerful mortals seeking to escape punishment for their sins upon death. 
you know, I realize since you're actually the original author here, this is like having Charles Dickens on the show and me being like, hey, it was the best of times. It was the worst of times. Am I right? Like, maybe, <laughs> maybe I should just let you. I don't know if you have this stuff in front of no, you. No, but... this is no, this is actually this is actually kind of cool. So, uh, OK. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah. So if you were going to uh, describe the, the shop tea in your own words, which technically this entire passage is, uh, how would you uh, describe that for the folks listening at home? Um, basically, um, like, so you're like a rich, awful person, right? And then, you know, in the, in Galarian, in the Pathfinder universe, Mm -hmm. um, you know, you all souls on death get sort of judged by Phrasma and go are routed to the appropriate place. Mm -hmm. Um, um, you know, and if you're a rich, awful person, that place you're going to go probably not that pleasant, right? And and if in your if you're have some foresight, then you're like, hey, what if I what if I basically make a proxy to like go in to and and receive my sort of divine punishment instead? Okay. Right. And and sometimes sometimes it works, but often what happens is somebody like figures that out and goes, wait a minute. You're not the actual person. Oh, right. Okay, cool. There was like a mess up in the sort of celestial bureaucracy here. Um, We're going to go get that person. We thought they were getting away with something. But in the meantime, um, you're free to go. And that sort of proxy soul that was meant to be sort of like this, but sort of like get their stuff instead of the original person. Mm -hmm. Shabti. So they're they're free to go and like roam the earth and do what they will, and they'll sort of have the sort of this sort of echo of the original person and the false memories that were sort of put in them. Mm-hmm. Um, and then they and then and then and then you as this sort of um, you're this sort of like karma Frankenstein's monster almost. Okay. Right. You were just you were just like built to like take someone else's karmic beating, um, but now you're freed. But now you have to sort of like figure out your own way. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's like one of these cool things. And and now this was an interesting one. This is sort of the flip version of um, the sombreva, um, where the sombreva they just sort of gave me like a concept, mm-hmm. and they're like, "Go nuts." Right. And I tried my best to go nuts. Right. Yeah. Within reason. And um, where the Shandi Redeemer, Sh- Shandis are, are an established part of lore, um, Galarian uh, lore in Pathfinder first edition. So I was sort of porting this from the world into sort of uh, for, for people who are maybe just starting out in Pathfinder 2 now mm-hmm. um, and standing up and sort of bringing it into this edition. Um, so then so then that requires where the Sombreva requires me to sort of mostly imagine things this one required me to do a lot of reading a lot of kind of thinking of how i'm going to adapt previous material in to this and sort of sum it up in a way you know there's whole big books you know the whole like big passages in books about the shop tea and their stuff and so so i had to sort of condense it and make a sample so when you you're faced with all that material you know mm-hmm. there is um basically Paizo is saying Quinn we trust you to figure out what about this is important for dungeon masters to know who want to use this in a campaign you know like they, mm-hmm. they know they've got a ton of stuff out there but they also know you have got that eye or that judgment you know um what did you decide to prioritize um like what was your your thought process on on what what made sense to pull into second edition um, you know, I mean, really, so, so like, I, I, I didn't pull any, any, it's different for a monster, right, uh, than a, than a player option, right, because mm-hmm. it, because it, in, in the first edition, that this was a, 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 sort of a player ancestry that you could pick, mm-hmm. um, um, but, like, doing the monster, my main job is to kind of take the source um, and then uh, 
come up with a good summation of it to like I wanted you to get the feel of the sort of themes in a shakti mm-hmm. and then in making this redeemer I'm making kind of like you know and, and redeemers uh, just for people who don't know is sort of a uh, it is a uh, in Pathfinder um, they don't uh, in Pathfinder two they had don't have paladins specifically paladins are a subclass of champions and redeemers are another subclass of uh, champion. And, um, and so, so sort of build, a uh, the redeemer, um, you know, sort of build an example of these, of one person, um, embodying some of these themes, right. They don't have to embody all of them, mm-hmm. um, but just some of the ones that sort of, I, I pick there. So, I, I mean, I, for, for this one, I, I emphasized, uh, kind of that 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 dealing like how like the shabdi are these sort of vessels kind of these conflicted vessels and so i tried to emphasize those themes um in the in the representative and in the write-up so okay so so the shabti redeemer is one possible expression of the shabti correct okay interesting so in theory they could come back to you for bestiary three and say um could you make a shabti alchemist or something for us um like if if they were to do that like if they were to say quinn give it pitch us another class of shabti do do you have one that you're you're like oh well this would be i mean if, if i if i could do and you know and they'll have and they have some entries where they might have different you know, multiple sort of examples, but like if mm-hmm. I were to do like a sort of another sort of NPC ish um, monster of the shop team, mm-hmm. um, I'd love to do one that was like a shop team rogue. Interesting. Um, and then and like one that sort of um, kind of like rebel is like, hey, I'm free to like do anything and be anything I want. Right. And so they like kind of like pick up all these like kind of like skills, all these sort of things. And they're this sort of like, you know, sort of trickster charlatan um, type who who just um, very flexible morality, let's Mm say. Um, uh, Which which seems which seems very reasonable being that they were kind of a being born from like a clerical error essentially well and in some de- to some degree they were intended to be con artists in the first place correct but they're supposed to like i does um does the galarian setting have newspapers or newsprint i don't even know but um, um like yeah. you know if they have like the um political cartoons where you know, the rich guy is arguing with Galarian St. Peter equivalent, but it's actually his Shabti. You know, like, it's like, yeah, I'm really me. I don't know. Um, that might be too deep a cut. I'm realizing most American children don't know what political cartoons are or newspapers. So <laughs> may- maybe expecting them to be relevant in Pathfinder 2nd Edition is too much of a reach. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But yeah, no, like like a rogue or a thief or somebody who's intentionally deceptive does make sense because it, it is leaning into I was born to lie. I was right. So like, why don't why don't we just do this? Yeah, why don't I lie for myself instead of lying for some rich jerk who didn't want to mm-hmm. go to hell? You know. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that, that's both of these are are just such interesting um, creatures uh, or monsters. Um, but yeah, I'm, mm-hmm. yeah, I'm not sure. Like, it, so, like, if I was a dungeon master, you know, but it kind of to some degree the same question as that I ran into with the um, the last one, uh, the Sombreva. Like, you know, it's like okay, so, like, yeah, having if I was gonna put like a Shabti in my story as an NPC, they they once again they don't seem like what the kids might call hallway trash. Or, or whatever. They're not just <laughs> randomly wandering around a cave with some spiders, you know. Um, mm-hmm. they're, they're probably, you know, have objectives, they have goals. Um, so, but the, the goals and objectives seem a lot more, uh, open-ended. Um, mm-hmm. so. Well, I, feel, I feel like, I feel like the Shabtis 
are a monster, very likely to like a sort of a creature when you run into them, very likely to be a quest giver, mm-hmm. right? Like you run into a Shanti, like you run into the Shanti Redeemer, and they're like, hey, look, I'm here, you know, like I'm here trying to do something on behalf of uh, Phrasma, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, maybe they give you their story you know, um, why they're sort of doing it. And they're like, Hey, I need help with this thing. Or, or they might be, you know, if, if we're, if, if it's that shop T rogue, right. Um, you know, you might sort of be running into them and they're like, you know, maybe, maybe they're trying to like, you know, swindle you. And, um, you know, it, like, I feel like somewhere, every time you run into a shop, I feel like the most interesting thing to be happening is to sort of, somehow you get their story right like kind of like hey i was like like because there's this person that they were supposed to be this fake person Mm -hmm. that they were supposed to be to catch the stuff and then they're like who they're trying to become and so you get that kind of like hey you know you're you're talking to one of them and you're just like look i was this kind of like you know I, i was supposed to be the proxy for some you know degenerate you know ruler um you know uh but as it turns out in life like in this life i have all i want to do is you know pet kittens Mm -hmm. right um you know and they sort of give their story and then maybe the players help them or um or 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 maybe you know it sort of i think there's an implication that they're trying to like turn away from the bad person Mm -hmm. um who who sets them up there but it's very easily easily that they could just continue to be that bad person right like like a shabdi could make a very interesting villain yeah well well speaking of villains like i you know i never actually saw this episode of doctor who but i saw somebody on reddit talking about how one time the master pretended to be a scarecrow for a few months near someplace interesting because he figured the doctor would eventually wander past someplace interesting and so you could totally have a <laughs> Shabti who is immortal. Uh, apparently, they don't die of old age. Uh, do they need to eat? I'm guessing no. Uh, I don't think so. Yeah, because because it says they don't die of old age, and so like functionally, you could have a Shabti who's just pretending to be a mannequin in a dress shop for you know a hundred years, waiting for. Mm some vampire they don't like to walk past one night just smash through the window and start rest trying to choke them out you know it's like yeah i knew you'd be by eventually you, you could do you could do weird long-term lying in wait stuff with a with a monster or creature like this mm-hmm. um places places that are sealed underwater you know ancient mm-hmm. tombs you know like where it's mm-hmm. like oh everything everything here is already dead like every room the players go into, it's just like, yeah, there's a lot of rat skeletons. There's a lot of these skeletons. You know, ev- everything else that's remotely threatening or interesting died off centuries ago. But, oh, here's something that doesn't care about the ecosphere. Beyond Bestiary 3, um, have you done any other work for Paizo recently? I know you have a lot of stuff you said is coming up that you can't talk about, but uh, do you have any other second edition work you can discuss? Um, so I did... Um... My first thing I did was I did a um, uh, Pathfinder Quest Archaeology in Aspenthar. Um, and um, then I did um, the, um, uh, it, the, the next thing I did was uh, material, um, uh, back matter material for um, the second volume of um, the Abomination Vaults. Um, adventure path uh called hands of the De- uh, hands of the devil and i wrote a section all about uh flesh warping um which is uh about as gross and nasty as it sounds yeah we, we don't need to go into too much detail about yeah. what flesh warping is but yeah, i feel like but... that's pretty self-explanatory um yeah, obviously uh... not too self-explanatory or they wouldn't have paid you to write it but um for people who are less familiar with pathfinder um an adventure path if i had to sum that up briefly that's like a series of kind of like adventure elements or like encounters that makes up what a public pathfinder group might play is that correct or 
I mean, it can be it can be a private, you know, uh, like a, a you know your general private group is. Mm-hmm. They're they're like uh, each in, so so it's it's a series of adventure books that all work together for some larger story. Oh. So it's sort of like if you can think of like each book as like a season of a show, mm-hmm. and then all the seasons together compile into sort of one big arc. Mm-hmm. Right, culminating in sort of the series finale. It will be in the last book. So I'm guessing the idea is that each book, like, you start with the first one, the party's relatively low level, and within each of these adventure paths, there's kind of a consistent feel or whatever through the story as it goes on, and you would choose different adventure paths depending on what kind of feel your party wanted. Is that correct? Well, yeah, I mean, so, like... um. So, say in the Abomination Vaults, there's this kind of like big, you know, it's this mega dungeon mm-hmm. um, kind of thing. And then, you know, in the first one, you start to, um, you know, you, you encounter sort of the first level of the dungeon and you start to learn about this further plot. Um, and then that drives you sort of further deep into the book two, mm-hmm. um, where you start to learn all these other things you're, you know, learn about this sort of stuff with like devils and stuff. And then, um, and flesh crafters, and then you, then that plot evolves into the third book, um, where it kind of like you know where it will tie together sort of the you know usually something from the first one um, will go into the last one. So so this one is a shorter one; it's a, a three part adventure path. Mm-hmm. But a lot of adventure paths, um, you know, their their sort of classic one goes about six. Mm-hmm. Um, books, and and so if you play through all the books in an adventure path, that can take you like. A year, oh wow, year and a half. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's it's, it's it's usually enough for like a a, a very long term uh, game. And like like you know, for example, like it took us playing with some stops and starts and hiccups to the schedule. It took us like about a year to play like Fall of Plaguestone, and that wasn't even an adventure path. Yeah, I was curious about that because yeah, Fall of Plaguestone is, as far as I know, the only published Pathfinder game I've played. I thought that that other game you were running was also published, but you're just really professional at making games. So, <laughs> yeah, you totally got me on that one. Um, That's awesome. But yeah, okay. So, so um, when you when you say though back matter. That's like appendices or sorry. There's so, a lot of so, jargon here. I'm trying to. Unpack. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no worries. Um, I'm happy to explain that. Yeah. So, so what happens is um, when you write an adventure, you like you'll have. You know, so, so when you have an adventure, you'll have the the main body of the adventure, what's happening. Uh, but then there's always kind of going to be these uh, bits of extra information mm-hmm. um, that are in the sort of back. Um, you know, like uh, if there is a big town it's centered around, there'll be like a little mini gazetteer for the town, mm-hmm. um, you know, a list of magic items, um, some pages for the most important NPCs, things like that, right? And so, like all that stuff is the back matter. So mm-hmm. like the non is not directly the adventure, but it's stuff that's related to the adventure that a GM will want to use to prepare um, and maybe give player, you know, give info to give players or just background. So like my, f- my flesh warping thing was all about kind of like what, it, it, you know, and a lot of these things also flesh out parts of Galarian too. So even if you're not using the adventure, uh, like, like if you're not using the hands of the devil, um, uh, book mm-hmm. uh, for the Abomination Vaults, that flesh warping thing might be actually useful for you as a GM for something else that you're preparing. So so, so there's a lot of stuff in the books, uh, like in, this, in the other, like, last third of the book that's actually generally useful often. Mm-hmm. That makes sense. Yeah, and so... Yeah, because a lot of people like to play with it and, and kind of make it their own, and so having more stuff mm-hmm. to work with. And I'm, ge- I'm guessing to some degree... They bring in, um, is it unkind to say freelancers like yourself? Is there a term you prefer versus like their full-time staff? Freelancers, fine. Okay, yeah. So uh, they bring in freelancers like yourself to fill in the gaps on certain things so that their core staff can kind of focus on the the big um, kind of setting the tone, maybe? Is that yeah i mean so so and, and i'm gonna i'm just gonna put the disclaimer I'm, I'm talking as i understand it right um like the 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 real people to ask sort of on their process process is probably paizo 
staff. Um, yeah, but, and I don't like, want to put you in a weird place. Like, if, if I'm <laughs> asking you a question that will get you in trouble for like, like, because I don't know industry norms, and if it's like, oh man, I can't believe Joe asked that. The gaming industry doesn't talk about this stuff. It's like, ooh, I wasn't trying <laughs> to be black, controversial. You're blacklisted now. No, I mean, it's, it's oh no, it's, I didn't it's, even it's think fine. about something bad happening to me. I was worried about bad stuff happening to you, but now I'm worried no, about no, both of us. Yeah, yeah, no, that's fine. We're fine. I, I think we're fine. Okay. I, I mean, we're. Okay. We'll, we'll find out. Yeah, but, yeah, no, we'll I mean, find... <laughs> Hello, Paizo lawyers. <laughs> Welcome to my show. <laughs> um uh no so 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 but basically what happens um you know and, and i've worked with lots in the past and like um you know and like in a bunch of other places like like uh how it goes is like you have freelancers who are doing sort of a lot of the sort of general like research and like building up the content and then you'll have and then they'll pass it on to developers right mm -hmm. and sort of development in the process is is um, it's different than just writing it. You're not you're not writing the raw initial thing, mm -hmm. right? But you're you're there to make sure that it is, um, you know, a keeping up to sort of snuff is is sort of like my understanding of it. This is my understanding of it, um, and, and from from what little I've done on it on other things, and then um, you know just being on the other end of it. But they're sort of refining the input from the freelancers, making sure that it's it's fitting in kind kind of the norms. Um, you know, answering questions, sort of like, and and then and then if there's on say like an adventure path, right? If you have authors writing different books, you're like a developer, and and, and that's why you keep this sort of developer on staff because they maintain context, mm -hmm. right? And and you know, and, and a whole bunch of other things, right? Um, you know, um, it's crazy. Is I mean, it's it's really crazy the kind of stuff that developers do. Like develop when you're when you're developing a game, you're you're holding like you know it's from everything from product management to game design to editing to like the whole whole bits, right? It's mm -hmm. it's real stuff. Um, so, but they're they're sort of they're they're weaving that freelancer content together and making it all kind of tuned up. Well, that, I gotta, that, that, that's my understanding. Of it. I got to say, I love this process. And, and let me tell you why, Quinn. It's because it has the parts that I like are the job of like the main staff. You get to do the brainstorming and you get to do the criticizing, but you don't have to do the work in the middle. You just, you know, it's a lot easier to go from, hey, I, I have a million great ideas. Let's narrow it down to a thousand. And then let somebody else do those thousand things and then just tell them why they're wrong than to try and deal with the stress of trying to do a good job at all thousand things. Well, I mean, it's, it mean, but, but it's also, I will say it's also sort of the stress too of, you know, trying to make sure the, you know, cause you, you know, you got to sort of talk to the folks and mm -hmm. like, 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 you know, the, the thing is if, if you, if, if me as a front freelancer, mm -hmm. if I end up very wide of a mark, Mm-hmm. Well, they still have to publish the thing, right? So you still have to sort of, you know, steer and you know, and this is the kind of thing where things could kind of come into sort of conflict because it's, it's there's not often a lot of, you know, and, and, and you know, there, I'm not going to sort of go into this whole thing, but like, you know, there, there, there can definitely be conflict where, uh, you know, things might have to have been sort of like diverged and like tweaked mm -hmm. to make it fit in with some last minute change and, and, and stuff like that. So it can be, and, and, and there's not a, not necessarily a lot of time to like do a ton of back and forth on like tight schedules mm -hmm. and stuff like that. So, you know, it, it can be, you know, I, I say as a freelancer, like, like I, I feel like a freelancer job is very like, Easy, you know, and I'm I'm always trying to do my best to sort of make it not far off the mark and all of this other stuff, right? You know, mm -hmm. put a lot of work into it too, but it was sort of like I'm kind of like amazed at how they stitch it all together. Oh yeah, um, and, and I mean, I'm not trying to say that that yeah, your yeah, job yeah. isn't cool either. I'm just like yeah, yeah, no, like because that's the other thing though is like in your position, I'm like, oh, this is great. I don't have to figure out which ideas are good. They already just handed me two to work on. I don't have to get it perfect because that's their job to fix whatever I get wrong. So I can just be free to create and, you know, like, it's no, so it, it works as a, as a collaboration in a, a very productive way, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, th I think, I think when it's going well, it's, it's really 
cool. And I mean, there's like, like in the monsters I did and other stuff, I can mm. see sort of where their edits and other stuff and like refinements to sort of my, you know, to my base ones. And I, you know, I've, I've been really, you know, when I look at the, you know, edits, I see, I see sort of most of my stuff there and I see like the sort of refinements and I'm like always like pleasantly surprised mm. at it. So. Oh yeah. That, that's always great when you send something to an editor and it comes back better. Um, <laughs> Because, mm-hmm. like, you know, it's very easy to be like, well, like, uh, you know, especially if your first experience with this sort of thing is, like, being in a college newspaper where, like, the editor doesn't necessarily mm-hmm. know better than you. But then when you're out in the industry world and you're working with somebody who's like, oh, yeah, this person has 20 years of editing experience. It's like, oh, it turns out people who have 20 years more experience than me at things are legitimately better at them than somebody else in college, you know? Right. That's right. nice. Um I was going to ask, uh, do you have any uh, independent projects that you're working on right now that you can talk about? You know, right now I'm mostly freelancing, mm-hmm. um, but I, I, I'm assuming like in the next, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at um, mid end year, um, start starting to release some of my stuff on my own. I, I think one upcoming one that I would talk about mm-hmm. um, is I'm actually working on one-on-one rule, like a one-on-one sort of Pathfinder compatible thing. Um, like Pathfinder is pretty exquisitely balanced mm-hmm. for group play. Yeah. Um, and it's 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 really wonderfully balanced for it. Um, but I wanted to sort of like something like like I play with my son. Like these are the rules that I use to like play with my son and mm-hmm. sometimes my partner. Um, just like hey, let's play Pathfinder, right? And it's just the one person, and instead of like getting a you know, having them play four characters or like altering the things in any ways. I just have these sort of set of rules that kind of um, map over. Mm-hmm. Um, unless you sort of play without like tweaking too much of the game. And so I want to sort of do that and I'll probably publish that um, as soon as I get something decent. Well, that's cool. For, for young people who are like trying to get into game design. Um, Mm -hmm. was it the independent stuff that you had already published that like started getting you, uh, the connections with the, the folks at Paizo and stuff like that? Mm -hmm. Or was it more like just applying for things blind when you were getting started? I put this out there, not that I think anyone, uh, can sort of like necessarily model it, but like as a sort of like one point of experience here. Um, so, cause like what, one of the, one of the big things that sort of helped open a door for me was blogging. Mm-hmm. Um, I would just always kind of like had uh, like, I, I don't know. I, for, for some reason, I feel like my brain is just sort of wired to take sort of rather like idiosyncratic views on things. Right. And mm-hmm. so I just, um, like I, I started a blog, uh, back in the day called, uh, at will, um, which was like a fourth ed D and D blog. Mm-hmm. And it was like most, but it was mostly rather than, um, it was, it was different from a lot of things out there because it was basically all alternate rules and homebrew and like crazy skill challenges that were like, I, I didn't, I, I, I saw what they were trying to do with it and I'd sort of like ignored the base skill challenge rules and just use them to make like my own kind of interesting ones. Um, and so like, I, I kind of got some, you know, some small dose of internet uh, fame for that. And it actually had, you know, had some folks, um, you know, asked to uh, ask, you know, Oh, I like this stuff you do on your blog. Uh, would you want to write for this? Um you know, and I, I did a, some small things here and there. And then I, um, uh, f- off of that, that helped sort of build like a portfolio that helped, um, you know, when I went to pitch for stuff like, um, um, you know, I think the first uh, first places I got published were, was uh, one of the first places I got published was Kobold Press mm-hmm. um, when they were doing Kobold Quarterly. Um uh, miss that magazine. That was really cool. Um, uh, and I published a few things there. Uh, and then um, uh, my first big thing, um, ironically, uh, was with uh, uh, Logan Bonner, who who is lead designer for Pathfinder 2E. Mm-hmm. Uh, but he was also, um, uh, Kobold Press did a Lost City um, open design contest. Mm-hmm. And so it's like you sort of pitch things and they sort of had sort of, you know, you sort of competed to sort of see who could get in um, to it and write um, uh, the 
source for it. Uh, and uh, was me, Trace Hurley. I, I can't remember if there was it. I think it might have been just me and Tracy. Mm -hmm. um, uh, maybe someone else uh, missed a while ago. I'd, I'd have to look back at it. Yeah, but, no um, and then we got it. And then and then Logan was actually the lead designer uh, for that. And we worked with him on that. And so that was like a, that was like my first big project, um, which is like about like a 10, 12,000 words, maybe more. Mm -hmm. um, again, I'd have to sort of look at my <laughs> thing from it. It was, it was like, a decade ago at this point but yeah and then from there you know i had i took a break for a few years was dealing with life stuff um but they're just sort of like you know blogging uh i i would say i guess one way to break in um is to share thoughts mm -hmm. right um you know um I, these days i don't blog that much um mostly because people don't really read blogs and i i sort of mostly just blab on twitter right as a way of sort of sharing thoughts um you know and then and then just don't you know i, I think the thing is to not confuse the attention any attention you get or don't get with the quality or impact of your work and just focus on refining the impact and quality and attention will come or it will not come mm -hmm. but it doesn't say anything about the impact or or quality of your work and so just just focus on those things and that, that's sort of where i've tried to focus on every once in a while you get confused and you think the attention is saying something about the impact of quality but it's, it's not yeah and, and this is this is one of those things where um you know it sounds like you basically got to where you were by just doing a, a lot of things right and i don't want to say small things because i don't want to diminish your accomplishments but like things that didn't necessarily immediately at the time seem like oh this is a huge win it's like oh this is cool you know, mm -hmm. and you, you just build a, a body of work over time out of these small victories, you know, and Correct. that mm -hmm. then, you know, at some point somebody notices one or two of them and you just uh, mm -hmm. start accumulating slightly bigger ones. And, and you know, um, I, I think one thing that um, might be helpful for some kids to hear who might be watching is mm -hmm. that, you know, you still have your day job too. You get to do all this cool <laughs> stuff, but you know, you have a day job and this is, I mean, I'm not knocking it cause mm -hmm. I kept mine until uh, like mm -hmm. last, almost, we're, I'm going on a year, but you know, you know, I've been making this Minecraft stuff for a decade mm -hmm. and uh, it's like, okay, you know, being able to do what you want to artistically and not having right. to worry about like, how do I get, the best paying gig so that I can keep the lights on with my writing, you know, might've helped, I'm guessing. Mm -hmm. Cause like, I, I, did, did you ever feel like there were jobs that you couldn't say no to? Because like, you were like, Oh, if I don't write this, I'm going to, you know, I can't. Well, that, that, that's why I have the day job. Right. Like, mm -hmm. like for, for me, the most important thing, like I, 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 I love the work that I do um, uh, for my day job. Right. I do, you know, computer stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, like, I love that work, um, and I feel like it intersects with game design work, but I, I, I love making games. Like, I, I probably, I just, I, it's the one thing, I, there were a couple times that I thought I was going to quit it, but, like, I can't quit it. Like, I, I really love it a lot, and so it was, like, this one thing that I didn't want to have to do make bad compromises for mm -hmm. right like i'm happy to make sort of good compromises and take feedback and things like that but i didn't want to have to do something that i didn't want to do artistically mm -hmm. yeah because that's right. one of those things is, is you know like i play as part of a collaborative team and so you know i might have an idea but it's not the best idea for the group you know and so i'll compromise but that doesn't mean I have to compromise on quality or that because, you know, like, for example, YouTube would say, like, hey, if you do these things, your videos might do better in the algorithm. And I would say, mm -hmm. well, you're not paying my bills anyway, YouTube. So I don't care if your algorithm punishes me. I'm going to make what I want, mm -hmm. you know, like like it's different saying no to YouTube mm -hmm. or, you know, you know, sticking it to the man versus refusing to be a team player, I guess. Right, right, um, right. You know, it, oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Oh, no, go on. Uh, you know, I, and I, and I think it's like, be yeah, it's it's just about being able to sort of make that um, 
choice you know i was talking about the sort of attention and you know like sort of whether you're going you know there's nothing wrong with wanting attention and and stuff for for your work but i feel like i feel like like like, you know you and i have talked like a lot about like you know your path and stuff like that and you focused on the sort of impact and quality end of the thing and the you know and then sort of the attention has accumulated Mm -hmm. Right. And it's like, it's like, if you, if you're willing to wait it out, right. Like I've been, I've been doing freelancing for, you know, over a decade. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, You know, and, and, you know, and feast and famine and stuff, but like kind of focusing on craft and sort of learning and getting better and sort of sharing. And then, um, you know, it feels like, I feel like I'm at a point now where, uh, you know, I'm certainly not a household name. I really don't want to be a household name. <laughs> like I, just, I want to be just known enough that people know I do good work and want to work with me, right? Yeah. And so it makes it, make, it makes getting good work easy. Like, like, I feel like I'm at that level. Mission accomplished. Yeah, you, you want to be at the point where you're considered for projects and you have the option to say no. That's Correct. It seems Boom. nice. Yeah. Like, that, that's, that's perfect. Yeah, that, that that seems great, and you know, wishing you the best on the way there. I see that we are basically at time. One thing I always want to ask is: Is there anything that you were itching to talk about that I didn't ask about? Because I would hate to see something get missed. Um. Well, there was my uh, you know secret twelve step plan to success for only you know, five ninety nine that I wanted to really get into, but we'll, 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 we'll have to do that later. Uh, no, but, uh, on a serious note, um, uh, no, I, th- I think we sort of covered that, but I mean, I just, you know, uh, want to have a chance, uh, to talk with you and, you know, nerd out about game design and Pathfinder. So mission accomplished. Yeah. Th- this has been awesome. Quinn for people that want Quinn's actual PDFs, that 12 step thing isn't real. If you go to the uh, <laughs> YouTube description below, you'll see a link to gumroad.com slash thoughtcrime, which is where all of his independent games are. I'm also going to put in a link to Paizo's website where you can find Pathfinder Best GRE 3. It's available as a PDF for about 15 bucks. That's how I just bought it, although I'm hoping to pick up the hardcover for myself next time I can justify a gift. I don't know, mm-hmm. my birthday's sooner or later. So, uh, and Quinn, you are on Twitter at twitter.com slash QH underscore Murphy, correct? Correct. Awesome. So folks can find you there. Well, thank you. Time skip. Welcome back to the interior of the Ever Given. I spent a few days gathering sand, smelting it, and filling this whole place in with plenty of glass. We're going to be able to add some things to these upper areas in a future episode. We've also got a parkour episode coming up that I just recorded. I can't wait to edit that, although it is like three hours of me missing the same jump. So that'll be a real joy to experience again. But anyway, thank you again to Quinn for joining us this episode, which you may have noticed was mid-roll ad-free. Thanks to $50 a month Patreon sponsor, Joy! In lieu of that mid-roll ad, I will now read a poem of my own devising. You can fill the world with monsters to your liking. Tell the best stories. Well, thank you again so much, Quinn, for joining us. Until next time, y'all, this is Joe Hills from Nashville, Tennessee. Any final words, Quinn? Uh, No, just thanks so much for having me, and uh, yeah, uh, let's do it again sometime. Keep adventuring.